Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Voyage 2021 General Aviation Summit. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sophie O'Sullivan and I head up the General Aviation and Drone Units here at the Civil Aviation Authority. And this is actually quite unusual for us to broadcast content in this way from the CAA. So please do bear with us this afternoon. But if everything goes as planned, we should be delivering you a series of presentations and topics that we hope you find both interesting and relevant. We had planned to do these roadshows live. We were going to go out across the UK and deliver a number of these. But unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, we've needed to move them online. That means some of the things you'll see today, like myself and my co-host, will be coming to you live and some of the things will be pre-recorded. So why are we here today? As you know, next Monday on the 29th of March, there's going to be an easing of some of the COVID lockdown restrictions. This means that for most of us, we'll be able to see a return to GA solo flying, which I know many of you are really looking forward to. We therefore thought this would be a really good time to bring together some content on how we as a community can facilitate that return to flying in the safest way possible. So we're going to look at things like human factors, just culture. We're going to show you some checklists we recommend. We're going to show you some case studies, all of the content that we hope will be helpful in trying to ensure the safest return to flying possible. We're also going to look at the future of aviation, so we're going to share some content with you on the Innovation Hub from the CAA. We're going to talk to you about what we're doing around electronic conspicuity, and we have an address from the Aviation Minister. At the end of the presentation, we're then going to talk to you about the GA Change Programme that we're running this financial year, and all of the elements that we're going to incorporate into that after our consultation with you. And we will conclude with a section on licensing, because we've had a lot of questions on that topic. Before I move on and introduce my co-host, I do just want to be really clear on dates. Next Monday, the 29th of March, is an easing of the rules, so there'll be a return to solo GA flying. So that could be by yourself, with your household or with your bubble. It's then in two weeks time, on the 12th of April, that you'll be able to go flying with an instructor. So there's a two week gap there and two key dates for us in the GA community. As with all things COVID, things can change. So please do make sure to check the latest guidance from DFT before taking any flights. So today I'm joined by my co-host, Neil Wimbolt. Neil runs the GA Change Programme within the General Aviation Unit at the Civil Aviation Authority. Welcome, Neil, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sophie. It's a pleasure to be here and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Sophie said, my role in the CAA's General Aviation Unit is the GA Change Programme lead. And later on, I'm going to talk much more about that. But for now, I want to introduce a topic very close to my heart as a currently very frustrated GA pilot, and that's the return to flying, or more specifically, the safe return to flying. So at the CAA, we are obviously very concerned and focused on ensuring that the return to flying is done as safely as possible. And underpinning all of this are our top three priority considerations, human factors, just culture, and open reporting. These have shaped and helped inform our plans for getting it back into the air safely. So what we've done to support this safe return to flying is we've, we've undertaken a number of safety activities and put out a number of publications from the CAA. We've held some COVID recovery workshops with key GA stakeholders and membership organisations. We had our last one of those yesterday. We've produced a number of videos and podcasts and we've also taken part in a number of GA safety evenings. In addition, we have an ex-military jet forum, which we plan for next month. So we've had a number of events and publications there. We've also updated and refreshed our Skyway code. That's now on its third version. and We released that on the 12th of March. If you don't have access to that, we'll be sending around details after the podcast and how, how you can get that in the post event pack. Looking forward to the weekend, we also got a special edition of the Clued Up magazine, which is all about return to flying. So we've brought together all of the resources that we think will help facilitate a safe return to the air, and that will all be in one magazine. We're going to print 10,000 copies of that, so some of you will get a hard copy, and we're also going to release a digital publication, so you'll be able to get that as a digital PDF and be able to interact with the links on there. Finally, we're also going to be updating our safety sense leaflets and we hope to release those to the community soon. 
Before we move on, I do just want to mention Skywise. Skywise is a platform that you can access for free. There's a free subscription to it. And it's our one-stop shop for all of the updates that we are providing from the CAA. So whether that's safety alerts, whether it's consultations, rule changes, airspace amendments, they are all on there. And if you haven't signed up for that, we will give you details of how to register in the post virtual voyage pack. Thanks, Sophie. So as I highlighted earlier, human factors is one of our top three priorities, which we focus on heavily within our work at the GAU. Now, I'm as keen as anyone to get back in the air, but I know that there are many things I need to consider before I strap the aircraft onto my back and head out into the wild blue yonder. Not all of them are directly related to flying, but can have a serious impact on my flying ability. So I know I need to just stop, think, and make sure I don't overlook them. Here, we've pulled together a quick animation on some of the items that people should be thinking about when returning to the air. Since COVID-19 reached Britain a year ago and lockdowns have been in place, pilots have been unable to fly and aircraft have been sat stationary for extended periods. When preparing for your first flight after lockdown, consider the following points and reminders. When did you last fly? Are your skills up to scratch? Consider taking your first flight with an instructor or discussing scenarios with them beforehand and what you would do if they occurred. Is your map still in date? Should you go flying with someone else on your first flight? They can provide support, encouragement and help spot traffic. Don't be afraid to ask for help. D&D is always ready to assist. Conduct a thorough check of the aircraft, paying close attention to wildlife, for example, insects in the pitot intake or nests under the cowling. Has the aircraft been knocked while it's been in the hangar? Is the fuel in the tank still usable? If it's been standing for a long time, it may have degraded. This will affect the aircraft's performance. If it smells or looks different to normal, consider changing the tanks. Is your maintenance on the aircraft up to date? Check if there have been any operational changes to taxiways for example, to keep parked aircraft. If flying from a grass strip, it may not have been cut for a significant time. Ensure you factor long grass into your performance calculations as it could drastically increase takeoff distance. Check that your airfield or the one you may be planning to visit is actually open and operating. Is your flight bag prepared? Do you still have your extra pair of flying glasses in there? Are your ratings and medical valid? Do you need to take disinfectant or hand sanitizer to clean the cockpit? The facilities at the airfield may not be open and available. Make sure your electronic devices are fully charged and software has been updated. Remind yourself how to use your moving map equipment. You may expect little commercial traffic at the moment, but refresh yourself on the rules. Be aware that less commercial traffic may mean more direct routings and within other classes of airspace. Air traffic control will also be out of practice or even not on duty. Where you may have advisories or support, ATCOs may be unavailable or not so quick to spot when you may be getting into trouble. Planning your routes and identifying areas of potential trouble should be part of briefings, even if it would appear to be an easy day. Make sure you give yourself time to plan your route, check for any changes to charts and ensure you are aware of any known infringement hotspots. Are you feeling well? This question is more important now than ever. There is a risk you could be spreading a virus that you may not think you have. Use the I'm safe mnemonic to check in with yourself. Illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, eating. Consider spending extra time running through the emergencies before you head off and know which checklist to use and where to find them. Pay close attention to NOTAMs. There may be unfamiliar drone related activity transporting COVID medical supplies. Check the weather, remind yourself of where you would go as a backup and what you would do if you inadvertently enter cloud. Consider the services you wish to use during the flight and expect that ANSPs will have reduced capacity. Think about using frequency monitoring codes and listening in if you don't wish to receive a service. Pay attention to operational surfaces. There may not have been anyone there for weeks and there could be fog on taxiways or runways. Be vigilant. Disinfect your cockpit. Don't forget we are in a global pandemic. Getting airborne. When taxiing out, check the brakes. 
if they haven't been used in a while, they may not be as effective until they've been used a number of times. Keep your first few flights simple. Allow yourself time to get back up to your previous flying standard without extra pressure. Consider taking the aircraft on a short local A to A flight before the first cross country. Don't be afraid to ask for help. D&D is always ready to assist. The situation with COVID-19 is always evolving and it is important to keep up to date with government guidance by checking the relevant .gov webpages. Look to your associations, your flying clubs and schools too. They are experts and are there to keep you informed and above all safe. Remember, if you are not flying with an instructor and you don't feel up to scratch with your abilities, don't fly. So are you sharing and learning with your community and helping everybody else to stay safe? It's never too late to learn from your mistakes and that's the key message we want to get across with this next bit of content. We're gonna share a real life example of where human factors outside of flying can have an impact on flying abilities and your capacity to properly understand and manage the situations we can find ourselves in. Are you sharing and learning with your community and helping everyone else stay safe? It's never too late to learn from mistakes. Here we share a real life example of where human factors outside of flying can impact on our flying abilities and capacity to properly understand and manage situations we find ourselves in. It was a bright day with four octus of cumulus cloud at 2500 feet and visibility beyond 10 kilometers. I was planning a day out with my partner flying from Leon Solent to Popham Airfield. I was busy before I left the house and in my hurry I forgot to add my headset to my flight bag. I borrowed a club headset instead and because it was a busy day all of the good ones had been taken. In my planning I noticed that the wind was coming from 360 degrees at 10 knots which is unusual in the UK. Nonetheless I factored this in. I planned on navigating around Southampton CTA and getting a basic service from Farnborough Lars. Readability was 5 from the tower, but when I started taxiing I noticed that every time I made a radio call a high-pitched sound rang through the headphones and it was intense enough to make any radio call uncomfortable. Once I was airborne, Farnborough Lars was very busy. I tried to make a few calls but realised someone else had beaten me to it each time. So I stopped trying to get a service early on and accepted that I'd just listen in on frequency instead. I did not use a frequency monitoring code. The rest of the flight passed without incident. On the return leg, I had already decided that I would make as few calls as possible due to the high-pitched noise and accepted I wouldn't be getting a service. The flight was quite a bit bumpier than the first leg and my passenger was a bit nervous. This meant that some of my focus was on trying to make them more comfortable. The weather also made it harder to stay on track. I tracked the Goodwood VOR radial, but amongst the distractions, I didn't think it was necessary to plug in the DME too. This meant I didn't know how far along the VOR radial I actually was and I ended up much closer to Southampton's CTA than I realised. What made this worse was that I had worked out my max drift based on the weather forecast but the wind was now stronger and pushed me further off course than I anticipated, directly from the north. I didn't know it at the time but I had managed to infringe Southampton's CTA. I was listening in on Farnborough Lars frequency without a listening squawk so they had no way of contacting me. I was admittedly oblivious. I landed back at Lee. The usual friendly voices on the other side of the radio were now serious and monotone. They called my aircraft and asked me to give Southampton a ring. That could only mean one thing and I was absolutely mortified. I felt stupid and like I'd been a really inadequate pilot, even more so because I still wasn't exactly sure what had gone wrong. Southampton very kindly told me what had happened and where I had infringed. It all aligned with my actions, or should I say, inactions. The watch manager at Southampton was incredibly helpful and very understanding. So what did I learn? Normally infringing isn't about one big mistake, but lots of smaller actions that by themselves don't seem to be as big of a threat, but they are nonetheless still threats. I now have a checklist in my flight bag for things to ensure I have with me before I leave the house. If you're going to be skirting around controlled airspace, plan to get a service from that specific ANSB. If you can't get a service, know what listening frequency will be and use it. And use the frequency monitoring code. Know where you are. Use a moving map or VOR DME to support your paper chart. 
Remember that the weather forecast is exactly that, a forecast. Allow for margins in error in your planning. For example, take two between you and controlled airspace. If you have a problem with equipment early on, turn back. It would have only been a minor inconvenience, but it could have made a big difference. So we've had a number of questions come in across various themes and areas that we've been discussing today. And the first one we're going to put up on screen is from John Bond. And he's asked, there is an easing of restrictions on April the 12th, and I believe instruction checkouts are allowed. Are we allowed to fly with a passenger or land away? Neil, what's the answer to this one? Thanks, Sophie, and uh, thanks, John, for the great question. OK, so the simple fact is that DFT are in the guidance here, uh, and the geo roadmap out of lockdown is on the gov.uk website. Uh, I checked it last night, and you can simply find it by googling gov.uk GA guidance. However, we will be supplying all the useful links in our post roadshow pack. Uh, please treat the DFT guidance as the single version of the truth, uh, and hopefully it should answer all your questions. So, Sophie, I'm afraid I'm not going to say anything here uh, that could contradict that DFT guidance uh, or be misinterpreted. But what I do want to add is regardless of when you go flying, on or after the 12th of April, um, and I will be going very soon after the 12th of April with an instructor um, for at least 30 minutes, um, I just want everyone to, to not forget the 90-day rule. So three take off, three as manipulator of the controls of the same type or class in the preceding 90 days prior to carrying passengers. Um, this, of course, can be done with an instructor in the aircraft. Uh, and if you're flying on a national license, then you can, of course, undertake these three takeoffs and three landings with a passenger as long as they are a qualified pilot. We've had another question, uh, Sophie, as well. This one from Jim Downey up on the screen now. Um, he asks, it's been a very difficult, um, yeah, was, sorry, it has been very difficult to maintain currency over the last 12 months. How do you propose to ensure this situation does not result in people's licenses expiring whilst making sure people return to flying safely? Thanks, Neil. And that's a really good question. And actually, we've, we've had a lot of very similar questions around this. So the CAA, we are aware that individual license holders have experienced difficulties in completing pilot training and checking during COVID. I mean, of course, because of social distancing, because of travel limitations. So what we've done is we've put out exemptions 1416 and 1418 to assist pilots whose ratings are due to expire and who may have not been able to do the normal revalidation requirements before that expiry date. So what that does is it provides an alternative revalidation criteria. So that means you've got a number of options. You can use those exemptions with the alternative revalidation criteria. Of course, you can undertake a proficiency check or you can carry on as normal. But we hope that does provide some flexibility. Those exemptions were due to expire at the end of April, but we will be extending them at that point and they will go on until the end of July. So we're now going to move on to the next chapter of our presentation and we're going to start looking at the future of aviation and we're going to start with a presentation from David Tate who is the um, manager of our innovation hub so thank you very much for joining us David and over to you. Thank you Sophie, hello everyone, uh, my name is David Tate, I am the head of the innovation hub at the Civil Aviation Authority and it's a real pleasure to be with you today to talk about the future of aviation and innovation in the sector. My team was set up just over two years ago now, um, and we were given a mandate by the CAA's board to respond to the ever-increasing trends around new technology and innovation that the aviation sector was encountering, but are a feature of many other parts of the economy and society today. Broadly, we can, we can group those trends as, the, as what's been termed the fourth industrial revolution. And the mandate that my team was given by the CAA's board was to create an environment where innovation in aviation can flourish in line with our principles. Those principles are consumer protection, public safety, and security within the sector. In delivering that remit, we've established a number of functions uh, over the last two years. We've iterated and learned as we, as we went about what services uh, industry was looking for in order to be able to bring their innovative services and products to market. Those services are, are a gateway, a sandbox, a regulatory lab, and then a business operations uh, team as well. 
we've gone from a team of, uh, and I'll give some details of those in a minute. We've gone from a team of, of two people originally, now up to 15. So there's been significant growth over the last two years. The gateway service is designed to make it easier for anyone to access CAA expertise. And, and many of you have already been dropping us questions and queries about the CAA's regulatory frameworks. And we provide a very open end uh, to the public and to, to innovators in the sector to under access expertise, guidance and viewpoints on the current state of regulation. Our sandbox, which is perhaps our most well-known service, is there and, and designed to uh, catalyze uh, new services and products coming to the market by maximizing the regulatory readiness of innovators to trial innovative concepts. That, that effectively means how can we use the existing very pro-experimentation and innovation regulations that the sector's always had to bring those new concepts to market faster and provide economic and social benefits to society uh, more rapidly than we've ever had them before. Alongside that, we have uh, what we've called the Regulatory Lab, which is a, a team which specializes in, in um, rapidly prototyping new regulations and guidance, ideas, and think pieces to help uh, groups, including GA, the wider other affected communities and innovators, understand what the CA is thinking about innovative concepts and technologies and what the path of travel will be forward for the future. We also think it's very important to recognise what are the gaps and, and, and where we need to do a lot more thinking in partnership with stakeholders across the sector to really drive forward these concepts and, and realise their, their value in future. Finally, our, our business ops team works closely with colleagues across the CA's safety and regulatory teams to ensure that we're uh, embedding the lessons that we learn through those capabilities across the CA's business. And so that we're driving and delivering the, the enhanced service uh, that, that everybody is looking for in the future. We obviously work in a, in a complex ecosystem with lots of other uh, um, players involved. As I've mentioned already, our colleagues and our regulatory and policy teams are key stakeholders for us, but so too is central government. We work very closely with the Department for Transport and have particular directives from the Secretary of State, but also work with Business and Energy and the Department for International Trade other, and any other department that has a mandate to ensure that the UK aviation sector remains at the cutting edge of technological development and international exports. Uh, we support particularly, and I'll talk a bit about this later, some uh, UK research and innovation programmes that have direct government grant funding. So in particular, the Future Flight Challenge and the Aerospace Technologies Institute portfolio, where governments invested strategically in new technologies. And then we work with international groups, particularly at an ICAO level or at international standard setting bodies like Eurokai to ensure that the, the CAA's perspective on innovative technology is transmitted and shared at a global level. And then finally, we also work closely with partners at industry associations and communities like yourself to talk about and have a discussion around how these new technologies will play a, land, play a role in the landscape for the future. Most importantly, though, what we've tried to develop um, within our, our having established a team is that we take a collaborative approach to regulatory innovation. And what you can see on the screen here is, is a pathway for one of the key technologies that we've been looking at over the last two years. And I'm sure the concepts that I'm going to be talking about are familiar to many of you. We identified through our engagement with our, our um, regulatory teams uh, in who are responsible for the oversight of the growing drones market uh, that technologies uh, such as detect and avoid technologies um, were coming to them to consider how we could help to, we could help grow uh, the potential market for beyond visual line of sight drone operations. Uh, detect and avoid technologies are one of a number of potential um, solutions which might allow for that for unsegregated drone operations to take place in future. And so we, we established a, a, a program to work with our colleagues across the CAA to, con to consider what the technological pillars uh, and the evidence that would have to be developed uh, in order to uh, deliver a, a safety case uh, to allow that to, to grant regulatory approvals could be developed. So we established an internal task force that sought to develop or define the regulatory pathway that you can see depicted on screen and what the next steps would be across the business. We use fundamentally the capabilities that we established in the sandbox uh, to work closely with industry and developers to demonstrate that their technological solutions in this space could meet 
the regulatory burdens that we were trying to, to establish. That gave us evidence, an evidence base that we could share with our colleagues uh, across the safety parts of the business to, to analyze and think about whether or not um, we could achieve the, the requisite levels of the target levels of safety that are needed in order to ensure we maintain the, the safety of the overall aviation ecosystem. And that, as you can see, that that's working along a pathway towards um, the development of a detect and avoid system for non-segregated BV loss round about the early part of, of uh, 2020. And that um, at that point, we started iterating on our sandbox in order to um, have some new dem technology demonstrators working specifically on that, that pillar. Now, as we've gone along that, we've developed new, uh, a number of CAA publications. They're developed by our regular, regulatory lab. Uh, and we do that in consultation with our colleagues across the safety parts of the business. So the, at the, while we're generating new, new thinking and, and evidence from our sandbox tasks, we're bringing along our regulatory colleagues at the same time to do, and publishing uh, for the benefit of the sector, all of the insights that we're gathering as we go through that process. So that includes developing toolkits like um, the evidence matrix, uh, uh, and um, the additions to CAP 1861 um, on how the, the, these technologies can be safely operated within an ecosystem. So that gives you an idea of that collaborative approach that we've tried to take over the last two years. We found it to be very effective. We've had uh, a number of companies now graduate from our sandbox and who have begun get who who've started to get those first regular approvals for. Uh, operations out with, within non-segregated space in a beyond visual line of sight context. So we, we found that this has been very effective. That regulatory sandbox capacity that I talked about has, has really proven to be to be very effective in responding in a rapid way to uh, challenges as they emerge. And one of those that came to light during the COVID-19 challenge was um, uh, the, the, the sense that government was very keen to uh, see how we could use all the possible technologies to support the frontline uh, response to the COVID, frontline services, particularly the NHS, in responding to the COVID, the challenge of COVID. Uh, with that in mind, the government through uh, the Future Flight Challenge launched uh, um, uh, a call for companies to come forward and bring forward proposals to uh, support the NHS operations with drones technology and to do so within a two to three month window. One of the things that our, our sandbox uh, is particularly effective in doing is triaging, understanding, getting to the core of the technological uh, and safety use cases that are brought to us by innovators and to then help them understand how they can fit that uh, concept of operations within the existing regulatory frameworks so that we instead of our usual approach which is to try and stretch those regulatory frameworks we could in fact um, uh, 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 we could try and uh, fit within that regulatory envelope in order to bring forward uh, demonstrations and technology use cases much much faster so we actively work, we worked with the Future Flight Challenge and UKRI to build a pipeline of, of cases. We brought in our regulatory teams, including um, UAS, uh, sorry, drones and, and airspace, as well as dangerous goods to uh, start building um, a multi an interdisciplinary team approach to uh, responding to these types of complex use cases because they need multifarious uh, approvals. And we, we facilitated the, those, uh, the development of a single con ops that could be shared with those teams um, as we went through that, that process. And it's a, it is a very complex one. So a, a really strong example of that is um, from one of our sandbox participants, Skyports. They wanted to link up two hospitals, one on Oban in the mainland of the west coast of Scotland to a, a hospital in the Isle of Mull. And as you can see, it was about 17 kilometers uh, long air bridge that they wanted to establish and, uh, and uh, which they wanted to put in place for a period of about a month. Um, that obviously had very complex stakeholders and who were using the airspace already. Th those uh, stakeholders had to be brought into that process and had to be navigated. Um, all of this going on while trying to, to respond rapidly to the, to the COVID context. And um, what was very effective about that use case is that we were able to, uh, we, we had one instance where at the end of the day, uh, the hematology clinic on Mull had run out of um, 
uh, uh, some uh, uh, the supplies they needed to keep the clinic open. Now, ordinarily, that would have taken about 24 to 48 hours to replenish those supplies. But because the drone air bridge was up and operating, it was possible to retask that capacity within about 30 minutes to ensure that the clinic stayed open for the rest of the day. So that's quite a powerful demonstration of how these technologies can provide just-in-time logistics in new contexts that we've never seen before. But what was particularly important, I think, for the GA community is how closely the innovator in this case had to work with uh, those the, the other stakeholders in the area, whether that was HEMS operators, the local uh, the local airport in Oban that was that was flying, local seaplane operations, and the local GA community to make sure that everyone uh, could share the air uh, effectively during the period of this trial. And what's very positive is that we're now looking for an, towards an extension of that uh, into longer term operations going forward. So what we're very interested in, in the innovation hub is how we start to scale those operations from one-off tests and trials towards something that might become something more like a regularized service. And that's something that has also been particularly of importance to the UK government and which they've put significant public funding into. So uh, one great example of that is the Future Flight Challenge, the, the, which is run by UK Research and Innovation. Um, that has a budget of approximately £130 million of government funding matched by £170 million of private funding. It's a four-year programme designed to demonstrate uh, three use cases. One is uh, uh, small drone delivery services. The second is eVTOL, uh, urban passenger services, and a third is uh, sub-regional uh, um, net zero emission aircraft. So uh, th that's obviously a very ambitious program, uh, one in which the government's invested significant public funds, uh, and CAA recognised that we were uh, we were a key enabler of the, the potential success of this this program. So what we've uh, sought to do is use those capacities that we've established in our sandbox and reg lab uh, and provide a dedicated offering to the Future Flight Challenge uh, in terms of those services and helping the participants in those consortia, which includes a number of GA airfields, to navigate the regulatory complexities of these uh, of very large consortiums that are being brought together by this challenge to um, work on these very complex use cases. So we might have a scenario in which we have uh, a GA airfield participating alongside uh, in a challenge in a consortium alongside. Um, companies who are using small uh, RPAS uh, and also while sharing the airfield with um, an electric aircraft um, that's providing passenger transport. So there's, as I'm sure you all understand, that's an incredibly complex landscape and a uh, number of stakeholders and myriad regulatory approvals uh, involved in that both safety and otherwise and therefore we we are using those, the capabilities and experiences we've gained over operating the sandbox and reg lab for the last two years to uh, provide that coordination and joined up support that's needed for this to be a success. So we think there'll be some significant impacts on the GA sector and significant learnings uh, from the GA sector from this and um, principally around how is uh, it, how are, is the air shared by um, different stakeholders? How do we consult within those different stakeholders? How do we ensure that everybody has equitable access to the airspace that is needed to deliver the social and economic benefits of uh, increased uh, aviation and an expansion in the sector? Um, how do we use aerodromes and airfields as testbed partners um, and to, to uh, derive future operating models for those aerodromes? And airfields uh, in future, which could be which could be uh, greatly enhanced through the deployment of some of these technologies in the UK and the development of new new economic models. And then, particularly, what I'm sure you'll all be interested in is the development of of new airframes and propulsion innovations. We've got a number of technology demonstrators that are focused on uh, using uh, GA uh, community uh, uh, sized aircraft, uh, but equipped with innovative powertrains and technologies, including battery technologies, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, um, hydrogen technology, and, and a variety of other propulsion technologies. So what we, we hope is that the Future Flight Challenge will provide some of the, the demonstrations of the technologies that you will be able to fly in future. 
That really has been the, the role of the, C, the CA's Innovation Hub over the last two years. Um, we think it's been very effective in, in helping to bring the regulator closer to innovative technologies as they emerge uh, into the landscape. And, and we think that's going to be very important for all of our stakeholders, including the GA community. So it's been a real pleasure for me to have the chance to share this with you today. Thanks very much, David. That was that was a really interesting presentation. And actually, we've had a couple of questions come in from our audience on the future of aviation. So could I ask you to cover those off for us now? So we've had a particularly interesting question, uh, which is asking about the uh, power units for both fixed wing and rotary aircraft that don't use fossil fuels and how far away we are from, from seeing uh, a replacement for traditional engine types. So I think that's a really e exciting question and one that my team is looking at very closely. Um, we're seeing a variety of different types of, of technologies and I think it'd be fair to say that our view is that there won't be a single direct replacement for the, the, the engine types that we have at the moment. What we're going to see is a diversity of engine types uh, or a diversity of power sources um, focused around the particularities of the use case involved. So, for example, as, you, as is rightly pointed out in the urban air, advanced air mobility sector of the market, we're seeing a lot of battery technologies developed because that's appropriate for a short inter and intra-city hop um, where we, we we can swap those technologies out, those batteries out very quickly in a modular fashion. Equally though, we're also seeing um, larger uh, passenger carrying aircraft um, being developed using technologies like such as um, hydrogen fuel cells. And in the UK, we've had one very exciting demonstration of that already by a company called ZeroAvia, um, which has been flying out of Cranfield um, Aerodrome. And, uh, flying on, on a Cessna caravan, so a GA-sized aircraft, um, and that's got a, a, a hydrogen powertrain within it already. So we've seen some very interesting developments there. Um, the question is, is now, is we're, we're starting to see with other companies, is the development and scaling up of the size of those engines, the longer endurance capabilities, but also um, new ideas coming forward. We have, we've got developers who are looking at um, ammonia cracking technology, developers who are looking at using hydrogen in a cryo uh, state. So we, there's a huge diversity of, of, um, of uh, power, supply, power plants and powertrain technologies being looked at at the moment with a view to coming forward in the next couple of years. So I think it's a very exciting time um, and, and uh, it's going to, it's, it's going to be extremely, I think, helpful in helping aviation generally, but also um, the GA sector in achieving the carbon and, uh, and net zero reduction targets that the UK government is, is ambitiously uh, adopting at the moment. The second question that we've had um, relates to a post-Brexit era and, and what can we do with the regulation and certification of new developments uh, to allow new low carbon options for aviation? Again, I think that's a, a, a great question. Um, we do have some, as I said, very ambitious targets from the UK government um, coming in the year of COP26 for the aviation sector as a whole, and those are, are undoubtedly shared by uh, uh, the GA community. Um, we uh, are testing and trialing a lot of these new technologies, as I said, I think the Future Flight Challenge uh, with significant government support behind it is, is going to be demonstrating um, a lot of those. And that's giving us as the regulator a chance to really to, to be in on the ground floor and learn uh, in partnership with the developers of these new technologies about what the regulatory frameworks and certification frameworks need to be for these new technologies in order to allow that safe transition away from the existing models of aviation that we have at the moment. So um, it isn't necessarily, I think, uh, entirely linked to, to Brexit. I think all regulators, including our colleagues at YASA, are going through, through the same transition process. And many of those forces are, are even more powerful and profound than, than Brexit. Um, but we need to, we need to be, uh, working closely with industry to understand the nature of the technology and that's the most fundamental thing that we can be doing as a regulator at present. Great, thanks David. Um, we've also had quite a few questions come in from our audience looking at the nature of GA airspace uh, and as David mentioned in his presentation looking at how the users of this airspace are changing as the technology develops. So in response to those questions, uh, we've invited Alex Coleman to share an update on the work that's being done on airspace planning 
and to come off, cover off some of those questions uh, that we've had. Uh, Alex, over to you. Thank you very, very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name uh, is Alex Coleman, and I am the uh, Airspace Stakeholder Engagement Manager here at the UK Civil Aviation Authority. Um, and um, as uh, you were allowed to inform there, I will be today covering uh, specifically um, um, plans around integrating um, UAS um, and the GA community. So currently, beyond visual line of sight drone operations in Class G airspace have to be segregated from other Class G users. Um, and this segregation is achieved by uh, time limited temporary danger areas. Now, there's not been a significant overall growth in recent years um, in these um, TDAs, as they're called. Um, in 2018, we had 29. In 2019, there were 22. And last year, we had 25 TDAs established. Um, although we, we obviously do appreciate this growth rate has clearly been uh, influenced to some degree by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, uh, it's, it's really worth noting that um, TDAs are not automatically approved and are in fact subject to regulatory decisions, much like um, other airspace decisions. And this, uh, and this process includes engagement with aviation stakeholders and considerations of user impact. Um, in July last year, we in fact moved over to a new process that um, closely aligned with our CAP 16, 16 airspace change process. And this includes um, much more in, um, transparency and increased oversight of the decision making process. Now, CA clearly has a, re a requirement to consider all airspace users' needs, and it also needs to provide um, a, a path for, for industry development. However, um, this also has to be balanced against existing airspace user needs. And this is something we very much do take into account with, it, with all our airspace change process decisions. Now, going forward, as, as, as the business use case for UAS increases in complexity, there will likely be an increased demand for UAS related TDAs. Now, we will have to consider at this point um, the overall demand of both uh, the management demand of managing those, those TDAs uh, and the structures within that, but also couple that with the overall impact of the UK air system. As demand increases, in fact, the CA um, antici anticipate the use of TDA for beyond visual line of sight operations um, will, will in fact become unsustainable. So, th so therefore, in the medium to long term, increasing demand can only realistically be facilitated through integration. To reach that solution, there is a requirement to enable industry to progress and support development working toward more integration. And um, a, a measured approach is required to support UAS activities to enable the development of the sector against the requirement to address the needs of the wider existing airspace community. Integration that would, this integration would likely be facilitated through supporting measures um, such as electronic conspicuity. Consequently, we at the CA are actively and currently facilitating several beyond visual line of sight operation trials. Initially, um, these will be done in TDAs because that's all we have. Um, but the idea is to get um, those uh, beyond vis visual line of sight um, trials out of segregation and possibly into defined airspace areas of known electronic conspicuity to facilitate interoperability. Um, for example, maybe um, a, a TMZ with an ADSB uh, transponder requirement. Um, yes, and I think we have also got uh, some questions around this area of the um, of the section, particularly sort of around airspace and and airfields. Um, so um, we have had a number of questions in from stakeholders um, asking what we at the CAA plan to do opening up uh, underutilized controlled airspace, um, as well as how we can limit the expansion of controlled airspace as we go forward. Um, questions like uh, from our, uh, our colleagues Andrew Reid and Gordon Innocent. Um, so hopefully um, this sort of broader answer will, will cover all of those. Um, the CEA's published policy is that controlled airspace should be the smallest volume necessary to safely contain the operations within it. Um, we have to ensure that a high standard of safety is maintained, obviously taking into account all users of airspace. Um, but we're also now required to keep existing controlled airspace under review. This review um, is, or this new responsibility is discharged through the airspace classification review process, which came into effect in uh, at the beginning of December last year, actually. 
Um, as uh, a, a volume of airspace comes up for review, um, the new airspace classification review team, um, um, which is responsible for this new press process, will look at a wide range of metrics, including uh, surrounding class two activity, and uh, make a determination uh, on whether or not the classification needs to be adjusted. We've also uh, received um, an interesting question from um, Gordon Innocen, um, and he's he's interested to know um, what the CAA's plans are about coming uh, becoming more actively involved in the planning proposal process, um, with the aim to to sort of help JO airfields um, from being used for future housing developments. Um, and here, um, the CAA's airfield advisory team um, are. Uh, the people who can assist, um, the AAT. Now, they've been recently established. They are a non-regulatory team which has been set up to support um, GA specifically. The AAT provide um, advice on a wide range of operational matters, as well as planning and development issues that threaten the, um, the GA sector. In addition, the AAT advises government on issues and trends that are impacting the sector with the overall aim and objective of helping um, UK GA to thrive. Now, um, the AAT is also able to provide advice and technical support to local planning authorities as well, um, and um, can play a part in sort of pulling together the local plan, etc. Um, so the good thing is all GA aerodromes can engage with uh, the CAA's um, airfield advisory team. Um, that's both large and small, um, as well as licensed and unlicensed. And uh, we really would rec recommend any GA airfield um, who, who are keen to engage with them do get, do get in contact with them. And, uh, and the final question um, I've been given uh, is from uh, Jay Pai. And um, whilst uh, the majority of this was covered in uh, my slide, I believe, he's interested um, to un understand um, a, a little bit more about uh, the CA's views on what he's, cl he's classifying the airspace grab, uh, largely for drone, for drone use. Um, so as I said earlier, currently uh, beyond visual line of sight drone operations in Class G have to be segregated from Class G users. And our current solution uh, for this segregation um, is through the temporary danger areas. Now, as I said earlier, um, we consider, given the likely increase in requests for beyond visual line of sight drones um, in Class G, um, the use of TDAs will be self-limiting as the airspace regulation utilization team, the team that, um, that looks after this, um, the work they have to do to deconflict um, the two sections as far as practicable uh, from one another and other Class G activity um, will ultimately mean the TDA approach for beyond visual line of sight drones um, is likely to become unsustainable. As I said, we're already um, actively and currently um, working on um, trials um, to um, get uh, them out of this segregation and possibly into new areas of airspace um, of known electronic contiguity to facilitate interoperability. And this is where the, uh, the TMZ example um, with an ADSB transponder requirement I mentioned earlier comes into place. Um, those are all the questions I've got. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Alex. That was really helpful and great we were able to answer those questions coming in from our audience as well. So now I'm going to hand over to Marcos, who is going to bring us the next instalment of our future aviation chapters. So Marcos, thank you for joining us and over to you. Many thanks, Sophie. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcos Callias and I work within the future airspace team of the CAA. We are responsible for electronic conspicuity related policy and today we'll be giving you a brief overview of what is electronic conspicuity, why is the CAA exploring the specific field, the considerations for an EC strategy, a quick update on an EC rebate scheme and finally a poll to gauge your views towards EC that will be presented by my colleague Colin Chesterton. So first things first, what is EC? Electronic conspicuity is an umbrella term for a range of technologies that can help airspace users to be more aware of other aircraft in the same airspace. EC, in essence, turns see and avoid to see, be seen and avoid. We've listed here some of the most used technologies for EC, such as ADSB, FLAM and Pilot Aware. Moving on to the question of why the CAA is allocating resources for the exploration of EC. The AMS, 
airspace modernization strategy that is, which contains a roadmap of advancing the current state of airspace, includes EC as one of the key enablers. EC has three main objectives. First, to enable the ongoing modernization of UK airspace by providing a better picture of the sky at any given point in time. Then, help to mitigate the risk of mid-air collisions in class golf and reduce the potential of infringements into controlled airspace. And lastly, to enable the safe and efficient integration of beyond visual line of sight operations. In order to achieve these objectives, the CAA is aiming to draft a comprehensive strategy, and there are various elements and interdependencies that we need to consider. Obviously, as a safety regulator, we need to, to maintain at least the current safety standards. This should still be the case when new entrants such as remoted piloted aircraft systems enter the airspace. There's a need to enable maximum accessibility for all while reducing airspace segregation. Then we need to enable the UK to become a market leader for aviation innovation and allow new entrants to easily integrate. Given the current state of airspace congestion around parts of the UK, an EC strategy should be able to contribute to airspace efficiency and reduce traffic choke points. We need to enable a competitive market that delivers a range of innovative solutions by using proportionate regulation. And lastly, there are technical considerations that need to be factored in, such as the scope includes all users and provides a solution for manual and autonomous operation. There needs to be minimum levels of emitted information by these devices. Accuracy in terms of information emitted and displayed. This could cover, for example, the accuracy of the GPS, GNSS source, and information reliability, which relies on the reliability of the entire device system. Finally, I would like to talk to you about the EC rebate scheme, which kicked off in October 2020 and will now be extended until September 2021. The scheme covers a range of EC devices and the rebate covers 50% of the cost up to £250. Eligibility criteria and further details can be found on the CAA website. I will now pass you over to Sophie. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Marcus. That was great. And I do encourage all of you to look at the rebate scheme because, as Marcus says, that has been extended. Um, and that's a great opportunity for all of us to, to get some of the devices that are available. So we're going to move on now to a presentation um, from the Minister for Aviation, Maritime and Security, Robert Courts MP, and um, it's going to bring an address about the future of GA in the UK. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this Roadshow event. It is a pleasure to be able to engage with so many of you across the general aviation sector. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to set out the government's ambitious vision for that general aviation sector. There's no denying that the last 12 months have been very difficult and that the aviation sector continues to suffer globally. But with vaccinations being rolled out both within the UK and beyond, I very much hope that we will all be able to return to the skies safely soon. Now, as many of you will know, the government has a hugely ambitious vision for general aviation in the UK. Simply put, we want the UK to be the best place in the world for aviation, and there is no doubt in my mind that this starts at the grassroots. It provides the entry point for careers in aviation as pilots, engineers, scientists and other highly skilled professionals. And we want to make sure we continue to inspire the next generation of aviation professionals. It's also crucial that we protect, enhance and support innovation in general aviation infrastructure. The network of airfields is a critical national asset, providing crucial connectivity and offering the potential for dynamic and innovative businesses to grow and to flourish. Airfields also play a vital role in acting as test beds to aid the development of new innovations in aviation technology, which will ultimately support an innovative and environmentally sustainable sector. But what steps are we taking to achieve this vision? We need a long-term programme of work to achieve our goals. And this spring, we will publish our GA Roadmap, which will set out the actions in more detail. We're continuing to work closely with many stakeholders on a number of priority areas, such as protecting airfields, airspace, promoting skills, technology and innovation, and proportionate regulation and safety. I see regular and meaningful engagement with the CAA and the sector as a key priority. 
and we're not starting from scratch. We've made great progress in recent years following the last General Aviation Red Tape Challenge, and I'm grateful to all the work of the CAA's General Aviation Unit in taking forward many initiatives on the back of that consultation. In the last year, we've also seen the launch of two exciting new schemes, the Airfield Development Advisory Fund and the Electronic Conspicuity Rebate Scheme, which I announced recently has been extended. And I hope some of you joining us today have been able to benefit from those two projects. We've also appointed our general aviation advocate, Phil Dunnington. I know Phil wants us to get out to meet many more of you in person by this point, but I hope many of you will have the chance to engage closely with Phil over the next 18 months. Now, of course, there is much more to be done, and our GA roadmap will clearly set out a series of projects we will take forward over the next 12 to 18 months to deliver a real step change for general aviation. My number one priority will remain supporting the recovery of the receptor from COVID-19 and continuing to provide as much clarity as possible to the sector through dedicated general aviation guidance. I'm also determined that we should be ambitious in seizing all the opportunities that have arisen following our departure from the ASA. We will be working closely with the CAA to identify the priority areas we can take forward, carefully considering the responses that you've provided to the recent consultation. Now, airspace reform will also remain a high priority, and I want to ensure an efficient, safe, interoperable and integrated airspace for all users. I'm looking closely at options to increase GA representation and engagement in airspace change proposals. And I will also be continuing to work to support the uptake of electronic conspicuity, as well as to support the CAA accelerating the delivery of GNSS approaches. Both of these projects will help support a sustainable and importantly, a safe GA sector. Now, for some time now, I have been personally committed to championing the strong and active movement in the UK for historic aviation. Pre-pandemic, the UK air display scene and the museum static scene were flourishing. More air shows were taking place in the UK every year than in the rest of Europe combined. This shows our national enthusiasm for proudly displaying and safely flying our valuable historic heritage aircraft. Historic aviation makes an important contribution to general aviation and ensures that our great nation's flying heritage is kept alive. And that is why the DFT will be looking closely at this area to ensure that historic aviation continues to thrive in the future. Our skills programme will also be a key area of focus, with several initiatives, such as our skills retention platform, looking to support aviation workers that may have been impacted by COVID-19. This is important for all businesses, both in GA and across the aviation sector. We will continue to strive for greater diversity by removing barriers to entry and working closely with our fantastic aviation ambassadors to raise more awareness about the different career opportunities that are available. Finally, as I've already mentioned, I will also be looking closely at our options to protect critical GA infrastructure, including airfields and the connectivity and vital services that they provide. This will include looking again at defining the strategic network of airfields, as well as promoting the role of airfields and supporting our net zero emissions ambitions, and as ever, working closely with the CAA's new airfield advisory team. So there's a lot for us to be getting on with, and that's just a few of the highlights of all the work we are doing as part of our general aviation program but i hope that's given you an early sense of this government's real vision for the sector and i very much hope to have your support in taking forward all of this important work as i mentioned genuine and meaningful engagement with the sector sits right at the heart of what we want to achieve and i very much look forward to coming out to meet all of you to discuss these priorities in person in the near future as soon as it's safe to do so. In the meantime, please be assured that you have real friends in the ministerial team right here in the Department for Transport, and we're looking forward to continue working with you in the future. Many thanks to the Aviation Minister for that address. Um, I'm sure you'll agree it is very exciting to hear the Aviation Minister's vision, ambition and enthusiasm, which I know is, of course, led and championed by the Secretary of State for Transport. Uh, I'm now going to channel my inner Boris uh, and uh, ask for the next slide, please. Thank you. 
So in harmony with the excellent work the Department of Transport are doing, you may or may not know that the CAA has been running a, a GA change programme since the General Aviation Unit was established as a result of the GA Red Tape Challenge back in 2014. Since then, we've actively sought opportunities for greater delegation, more proportion regulation, and the removal of red tape or gold plating. Alongside the GAU's day-to-day -day role of regulating in a more proportionate way, the GA Change Programme has, to date, delivered over 100 beneficial outcomes for GA, some of which are on the screen, um, such as the introduction of single-seat deregulated aircraft, greater delegation to the LAA and BMAA, the introduction of e-conditions to make it much easier to build and fly experimental aircraft, such as the Rolls-Royce Axel project. And just last year, we introduced the ability for operators to conduct paid for passenger flights in ex-military multi-engine aircraft, again, helping to boost the historic aircraft sector. And amongst many other initiatives, the programme also delivered the Skyway Code, which has, of course, just been updated to version three, as Sophie mentioned earlier. We're all passionate about GA in the General Aviation Unit and mostly all aviators or engineers ourselves. Uh, we're continuously looking for opportunities to improve the sector. And to that end, we ran a consultation towards the end of last year, seeking out opportunities for more benefits now we have left EASA, plus also seeking opportunities in the way that we can work better with the sector. Have the next slide, please. Thank you. We ask questions to help us better understand how we can help the GA community and its associated businesses and industries to flourish after leaving EASA and to identify its specific priorities. How we can engage with and work more efficiently, constructively and collaboratively with the GA communities in delivering our objectives. And finally, we needed to understand better the priorities of those who are not part of the GA community when considering the future of general aviation in the UK. Have the next slide, please. So as you can see, we captured a lot of data, um, which we finished analysing about a month ago. And since then, we've been putting together a new ambitious GA change programme for the upcoming financial year 21-22 and probably beyond. And we're going to be launching this as close as possible to the 7th of April. So it's my intention that the consultation response documents, so our reply to your feedback, will be published on or around the 7th of April. The key themes that we received through that consultation were, please, 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 can we simplify and rationalize GA flight crew licensing? Okay, perhaps there weren't quite so many pleases, but we, we absolutely hear you. Um, and just to reassure everyone, this will be one of our strategic projects. And on that, we have had a couple of questions come in. Uh, the first one's from Peter Cox, and he says, licensing is, to my mind, grossly overcomplicated to such a degree that I am unsure of the currency requirements. Is it time for a ground up rationalization of the license system? Um, fantastic question, Peter. Uh, and I'm pleased to say, yes, it is time and we will be doing it. We've also had a question come in from Simon Skinner. Uh, and he asks, is e-licensing coming to this country? And if it is, what is it likely to involve? So Simon, I want to, I want to reassure you that when we're looking at the full ends to end piece of, of simplifying and rationalizing flight crew licensing, we're not only going to look at the products, so the type of licenses, um, the ratings, the currency requirements, et cetera, we are going to be looking at this far more holistically as well. Now, of course, it's important that we do this in a phased approach. Um, and we're doing a lot of tactical work at the moment in the CAA to improve uh, our forms um, and making those uh, online as much as possible. But as part of this end-to-end -end piece, we, of course, are going to be looking at the end user experience. Um, and digitizing is clearly part of that agenda. Um, I think we all agree that being able to have licenses on our smartphones, being able to have instant re re 
responses to when we uh, completed a test, et cetera, has got to be the way forward. Um, and I can assure you that this is very much in the melting pot of what we're looking at. Other feedback that we had from the consultation was around, can we do the same? Can we simplify and rationalize airworthiness and maintenance regulations? Um, can we learn anything from the FAA or other national regulators? And my answer to that is yes and yes. Again, this will be another strategic project. Now the key to the GA flight crew licensing and airworthiness strategic projects will be to take a considered phased approach, which does not make any rash implementations. The intention is to remain within the ICAO framework and diverge from EASA wherever that is the right thing to do. And believe me, we are going to be bold with that. Um, and we will consult the sector to make sure that it is indeed the right thing to do. But we will diverge where we can. We plan to partner with the GA community on the de development of these projects and ensure that whatever we propose has considered all possible impacts and benefits before implementing anything. I'm sure you can all agree that getting this right is more important than getting it done quickly. There was also very clear concern for GA airfields, and we hear you. Uh, I'm as concerned as the next pilot. And as we've heard from the Aviation Minister, we have recently set up an airfield advisory team to work with at threat and other troubled airfields. Now I'm proposing that we work much closer with that team and that we share intelligence between the general aviation units and the airfield advisory team on a weekly basis. Another key area of feedback was around our publications and guidance, etc. We must and will improve both the accessibility and readability of our information, uh, which is why we are going to run a cross-cutting clarity and guidance project to make a real impact in this area over the next 12 months. Next slide, please. So as you can see from the timeline, we're approaching the end of March and are currently in the process of doing several things. We're making sure we have the resources and skill sets in place to undertake the programme. We're setting up the GA change panel, which, by the way, 85% of you said was a good idea. We're producing the consultation response documents, which, like I said, we hope to release on or near the 7th of April. And of course, we're setting up the projects and activities because we, we really do want to deliver for the GA community and we want to do this as soon as possible. And as you can see on the slide, we have already targeted some relatively quick wins. Finally, I just want to say as a GA pilot that I think the coming years are going to be very exciting for GA. And hopefully we can, we can move on from frankly what has been a very difficult 12-month uh, period for everyone for many different reasons. And we're going to work really hard to help get the sector set up to be world beating. Thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. Very, very well said. I think I fully, fully echo those, those thoughts. And I, and I do hope what you're hearing is, is really a playback of what you've told us in the consultation. You know, and as, as Neil has covered there, those themes came through really clearly, whether it was the simplification of FCL licensing, the change panel, really improving the clarity of our guidance, how we tackle maintenance, our awareness, all of those themes were clear to us. So I hope, I hope there's some familiarity there and you are hearing us play back some of the things that you've told us. So speaking of what you've told us, we've had an awful lot of questions around licensing, which is which is a complex field. So Jim Marin, who is our SME in that area, um, has come along today and is going to uh, hopefully help answer some of our questions. So over to you, Jim. Thank you, Sophie. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Marin and manager pilot training, licensing and policy at the CAA General Aviation Unit. Thank you to all for submitting your questions to the Virtual Voyage team. We'll reply to them all in due course and publishing question and answer summary sheet as part of the post event pack. We've had so many great questions. We're not able to answer them all today. So I hope to cover the main themes and areas of interest. And we're going to start with the LAPL, the Light Aircraft Pilot Licence. Just like in the webinars of late 2020, we've had lots of questions on this. So just to remind you, it now is a third country licence. It does not conform to standard PPL ICAO Annex, and therefore we refer to it as a sub ICAO licence. And currently, there's no mutual recognition of pilot licences between the UK, EU and EASA. So this means LAPL use outside the UK is very limited. And to explain that in detail, we've got an excellent summary sheet for the LAPL on the CA microsite site, 
under private pilot. That's been produced with expert input from our colleagues at EOPA and DFT. So if you've got a LAPL and you haven't read this already, I strongly recommend you go and do this because a lot of the questions that were getting asked are covered off in this summary sheet. So in 2021, my team has spent a lot of the time writing exemptions and COVID recovery support. So it's been a very busy and challenging period. So I'll give you a summary of exemptions that we have in place and what's coming. And as a reminder, an exemption is not an easy thing to do because we're legally flexing the law. So we'll start with 1471. That's now been published. And this enables limited use of national pilot licenses with part 21 aeroplanes and touring motor gliders. We recognise this as a limited offering and that's due to the legal constraints of an exemption and this will be in place until there's a permanent change in the law which our colleagues at DFT are working on and they aim to do that before summer of 2021 and the good news is when the law is changed uh, it will be less restrictive than the exemption. As part of COVID recovery then we've got two exemptions, we've got 1416 and 1418 which cover revalidation by experience. They will be extended consecutively until the end of July 2021 and we believe that will help in the recovery, it will pilots where they can to revalidate by experience rather than undertaking a proficiency check. To support balloon and sailplane pilots, we've got another exemption which should be available in the next couple of weeks, and that's extending the license conversion period for BFCL and SFCL until the 8th of December 2021. Other things that are going on, well, we still have the UK EU transition period microsite up and running, and there's also really good information on there, so I would encourage you to read that. Skyway Code version 3, that's available free of charge on the CA website. Again, I'd encourage you all to read that before we return to flying. Some really useful and pragmatic information in there about operating safely in a very user-friendly style. And finally, we really do recognise this has been an exceptionally difficult period for GA. So we wish you all safe and successful return to the skies uh, shortly. And my top tip is before you go, check your licence, rating and medical. And if in at all doubt, go and talk to and fly with an instructor before flying solo. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Very well put. And thank you to everybody for attending today. We are conscious we've covered a lot of information. Um, we hope we've given you some good safety information to really encourage that safe return to flying. Um, we hope you've now got a good understanding of what our innovation hub is doing at the CAA. We've given you some key information on electronic conspicuity and we've seen your feed in and feedback to that, which is really going to help us. So thank you very much for the contribution there. We've heard from our aviation minister and just how supportive our government is of GA, which I think is fantastic for us in the sector. We've heard from Neil about the future of our change programme and what we're planning to do there. And hopefully Jim has answered some of your questions about licensing at the end today. So we're going to produce a playback video and that will be on the CA's YouTube video and that will be available from the beginning of April. And we're also going to send around a post roadshow pack and that will have all the links to the presentations and to some of the things I've mentioned today, like the Skyway Code and the Clued Up magazine. So thank you very much for joining us and we wish you a really safe return to flying next week and we wish you all well. Mm -hmm.